All right, hey, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to make sure we have enough time to uh, do all the things I want to do today. Talk, all that stuff. If you wanted to ask a question, now's a good time to do it. I, I want to just come out of the gate real quick and say that uh, how much I enjoyed the last couple of weeks. I love, look, I love Q&As. I love those. I love to ask me anything because uh, they're so authentic. I think we get to deal with some really important things. I got asked by a couple of times uh, from people if we were doing another Q&A this week. In a way, yeah, we are. Um, you've had the opportunity to ask us as married people further down the relationship road what, what time and experience have taught us. And hopefully, we were able to provide some encouragement and some perspective. I appreciate a lot of the feedback from, we got from uh, all of you, both, both during and after the sessions. But the one group that I don't think that we've really heard from is one another. That's your peers. So again, I'm asking that question. I want to challenge you. Uh, if you could ask the opposite sex one question and you'd know you'd get a sincere and honest answer, what would you ask? I think that's a fair question. Like if you could take it to say, say guys, I need to know this. Ladies, I need to know this. Because I feel like there's a certain amount of... Uh, mystery there, if you will, or disconnect. Um, it's interesting because, you know, in your, look, I grew up before cell phones. I grew up when you couldn't just randomly text somebody. You actually had to call them, which was terrifying, by the way, especially if you, you know, call and you get their mom or something like that. Who's on the phone? It's a boy. I didn't call girls. It's fine. You know, and so, you know, now the scariest thing someone could do is actually make a phone call. Like, I don't want to pick this up. Uh, how many of you, like, just ignore phone, random phone calls, right? All of you. I know. Right. Who would call? If you want to talk to me, text me. So uh, I think the art of discussion, I think the art of conversation has ended, and I think the art of asking questions has fallen by the wayside. So that QR code is right there on the screen. I'm going to give you a second to do that. And, and I'm, not going to, I'm not going to expect the guys or the girls to, to answer these questions today because... We'd be here all day, but I do want to throw some of this out. So it's in your, it's in your bulletin, too. Um, I'm going I'm to switch my screen real quick and uh, see, what, see what I'm coming. There we go. So let's see if I can bring it. So let me, these, will, these will come up. Oop, hold on. Let's see if I can get this to come up here. There we go. So some of the questions you're asking... Uh, will a single man please raise their hands? <laughs> and then, of course, Beyonce, all the single ladies, put your hands up. Oh, 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 okay. You know you are. Uh, girl, I like this one. Girls, how do we get you to tell us what the problem is when you're upset? That's a valid question, by the way. And how do we get to tell you where you want to eat? I think more relationships struggle from the question, what do you want? I don't care. Because that's a lie. Because <laughs> you do care. And I, so, uh, but that's a good one. Uh, guys, how do we get you to clean up after yourselves or the house without nagging? Oh. I know how to answer that. How do you? You just ask me nicely. And I'll do it. Ask you nicely and you'll do it. Okay. Also, I'll, I, I'm going to say this. Asking is good, too, because, you know, I, uh, I can't read minds. So uh, I've, noticed, I've noticed this, and I, have, I have, and I have a house full of women, so I've noticed that sometimes I think they forget that uh, we can't read minds. All right, let's see. Uh, I, how are you feeling? Fine. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do love good food. That's a good one. Why do men who have nothing to offer have the pure audacity? That's a great, that's a great question. Why do, why do the men who have nothing to offer have the pure audacity? Um, let's see. I don't know if this is... Uh, let's see. Is this, why isn't this... Ref it's supposed to refresh. Hold on. Let's see if it all... Because uh, it should be uh, all this. Uh, come on. We'll see. Maybe it's just being dumb today. All right. Well, okay. Oh, there they are. All right. 
Let's see. Guys, what do you feel when a girl cries in front of you? You know, it's a fair question. Um, thinking about it now, aren't you? Uh, there you go. Uh. All right. Let's see here. There we go. Uh, the pure audacity. Uh, let's see here. Do you love good food? Uh, girls, why are you always washing your hair? That's important. Uh, will the single Christian ladies please stand up? You don't have to. That's okay. What church do you attend? You should know. Um, guys, uh, do you consider chivalry to be outdated? Yeah. Amir's got a really good speech on chivalry, actually. You still remember it? I bet you do. Ah, all right. All right, let's go through these real quick. Guys, how can a girl respectfully let you know they are interested but still let you do the pursuing? How can a girl respectfully let you know they're interested? You know, it's not, yeah, you could talk to them. Hey. I'd like to get to know you better. You should ask me out sometime. All right, all right. <laughs> I like the life hack. Ask them to guess whether you're taking them. Where are we going? You know, in and out. That's right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, why don't men ask women out on dates? Why do they call them hangouts instead? Ooh. I think it takes the pressure... I think it takes the pressure off a little bit. No, no, it's not a date. We're just, we're just, we're just hanging out. We're just saying, is this a date? Is it a date? I don't know. Should it be a date? You want it to be a date? Clarify. Okay. Can I just say that? Please clarify. Like, what's that? That was you for three years. That was many of you three years. So is this a thing? Look, like Kristen and I, I think I've said this, but uh, that old Eagle song, Take It Easy, that was Kristen and I's like theme song for our dating. And at one part, I'm like, so is this a thing? Are we actually dating? Maybe we should. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Ladies, do you care if a guy is not a virgin? I'll admit those experiences were a mistake, and now I'm waiting for marriage. It's a valid question. Does a guy in an apron turn you ladies on? <laughs> not going to touch it. Yeah, Brandon's not here. Okay. Uh, who is the cutest pigeon? Jigglypuff and Kirby. Where's the best place to meet people? Oh, where's the line between chivalry and benevolent sexism? Chivalry does respect, sexism doesn't. Done. All right. Why do you all like tea sweet? All right. I know. All right, good. My point, look, that's good. Uh, if you don't like that answer, just shake it off. Okay, uh... <laughs> Too much? Too much? Okay. All right. Listen. We'll come back to those. I'll review those. Maybe we'll post them. Listen. Thank you. Look. The reason I'm asking these questions, the reason I want to challenge you to ask these questions and look at this is because one of the things I learned as a pastor a long time ago is that the hardest thing to do, and as a human being, is ask the right questions. Asking questions in a relationship is huge. And learning to find out things about people, that's how you do it. And asking those questions can be very relieving, the right, uh, revealing. The right question, asked the right way, is revealing and often gives you more of the answer than you expected. Because if we pay attention, the questions we ask uh, for our discussion time, even up here, you're barely going to find an answer that requires a simple yes or no. Asking about chivalry, asking about dating, asking about whether or not you're okay dating a virgin. Those are important questions, Okay. Look, there's a big difference between asking, like, do you like bananas? Or asking, what do you think about bananas, right? One's yes or no, all right? And the other one, it, 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 the other one asks you to describe it. Like, if you follow it up with why or what helped shape that thought, you're going to discover that maybe somebody had a tragic backstory with bananas or some Mario Kart trauma or something <laughs> versus, you know, or someone who just, you know, I just love the way they taste, man. Um, the point is, look, 
the point is, is when you ask the right question the right way, then the answer is going to be a lot deeper and more interesting than simply asking, than, than simply saying, do you like bananas? And here's my point. I want you guys to learn to ask questions. I want you guys to learn to ask these questions and not be afraid to ask these questions because it is in the asking of these questions and discovery that you find out, uh, first of all, what is important to this person because that's really, really important. And, you know, you find out, the, you, you start peeling back these layers and you find those things out, you know, saying like, do you like kids? Oh, I love kids. Okay, do you like your own children? No, I don't want my own kids. I like everybody else's kids. That's a totally, completely different thing, right? Or do you want to have kids? Oh, no, right? I just like, you know, I have a friend who's a great aunt. She'll never have her own children. But she's a great aunt. Look, and listening to people's questions is huge too because the questions people ask is important because the questions reveal what people are going through. They reveal concerns. They reveal struggles. They reveal a desire to find a solution to a perplexing issue. Uh, we seek counsel and advice in our life. Why? Because we want clarity. We want understanding. And with clarity comes the ability to make decisions and to move forward. And so when someone asks a question like chivalry, like where do you want to eat, all those things, it really is important that we don't dismiss their question because even if we think they're trivial or obvious because it's important to them and if it's important to them and if we care about them it should be important to us and our ability to answer or support their question might be exactly what they need so i wanted you to think about these questions if you could ask these questions and maybe the question is is are you asking these questions to the opposite sex are you asking the hard questions are you getting into these discussions are you engaging with people and finding out what's important to them and finding out if your ideals and values align, okay? And one of the reasons we did the Q&A the last two weeks is because I wanted to know what is important to you. And for the most part, I found the questions were sincere and genuine. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate the vulnerability we got from people. And one of the reasons that we do these questions anonymously is so people can have the opportunity to ask a question uh, without the concern that people are going to think it's stupid or an obvious question. Because I have found that it, when one person has a question, usually they're not the only one to have that question, okay? So just to touch on the questions you asked the past two weeks, some of the themes that came up in our Q&A were dating expectations, physical boundaries, biblical roles in a relationship, navigating rejection, past relationships, catfishing, attraction. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to talk about the specific questions. I think that would... Because that's going to kind of violate what we were trying to accomplish anonymously. You know? And people were getting around saying, did you hear the guys ask this, the girls ask this? That's fine. Have those discussions. But for those who took it seriously, it really revealed a desire to get relationships right. And some of your questions have specific context. Some of them, either because someone has had an experience they don't want to repeat, right? You've learned because failure is a very good teacher, isn't it? Yeah. Or because uh, they don't have a proper context to understand biblical principles, such as healthy role models teaching them this stuff. And I know some of you come out of, you didn't have healthy parental role models. You don't have people in your life that were saying, this is what this should look like. This is how you treat a woman. This is how you respond to a man. Okay, and if you don't have those, I can't expect you to know those things. But I think that underlying all of the questions and the misunderstandings and the anxiety that were surrounding dating if there was one word that encapsulates what I saw these two weeks, the word would be fear. Now, that's not a word we use a lot when it comes to dating, right? Complicated, maybe. Uh, frustrating, expensive, exhausting. I hear all that all the time, but at some point in every dating relationship, fear reveals itself, okay? Now, I'm not talking about a fear of dating. Some of you don't, you're not afraid of dating. You'd like to go on a date. The fear, I'm talking about a deep-seated concern and issues that permeate our character and our identity, and they haunt us as we navigate the relational landscape. And fear has some very debilitating effects that, that, that rear itself. It kicks in our fight or flight or our freeze response, which looks like either running away, right, from relationships, this is scary, I'm out, um, or, or uh, becoming defensive, like when those questions come up, you defend yourself and instead of just being honest and vulnerable, or, or not responding at all, and none of these typically have a positive outcome. But fear also has other side effects, right? The problem with fear is that it causes us to act irrationally, and we can quickly become a victim of our own making. Uh, desperate women become easy prey for manipulative men. 
Weak-minded men become victims of overbearing women. Fear often makes us fail to stand up for ourselves because we don't want to be rejected, or it causes us to defend ourselves because we don't want to be exposed. And fear is the, the root of both victims and those with a victim mentality. Okay? It's the root of genuine victims, and it's the, the root of those who have a victim mentality. And fear leads us to fail to comprehend our identity in Christ and therefore sets us up to fail to meet our potential in our relationship. The fact is, no healthy relationship should be rooted in fear. No healthy relationship should be rooted in fear. Even when the Bible tells us that, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. I've been reading through the Proverbs. I've been seeing that. Uh, it also reminds us that God loves us with an everlasting love. Okay? So fear and love aren't compatible in our relationships because we can't experience one when the other is present. And in 1 John 4, it says this. It says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever, uh, for, uh, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So in this context, in, in 1 John, and you should read chapter 4, it's great. John is talking here about how God's love has transformed our relationship with him. So through God's love and through our faith in Jesus' sacrifice, we don't have to fear standing in front of God in judgment. I don't have to be afraid of God. I can have fear of the Lord because I know what God is capable of, right? But I don't, like, I'm not afraid of God. I'm not like, oh, he's out to get me. He's going to punish me. You know, we have this idea sometimes that God is just waiting for us to fail so we can just, bah, zap, I was waiting, right? God's like, come on, screw up, right? That's not what God's about, okay? God is about loving us to a point where he wants us to be in a right relationship. He doesn't want us to fear him for judgment. He wants us to love him. And we, when love is present, fear is dispelled because love, true love, biblical love creates safety, which produces vulnerability and intimacy. And that intimacy is emotional and spiritual and ultimately physical. And I talked about that with the ladies and I've said it with the guys that when a woman feels safe, especially, it's much more easier when she feels safe emotionally and spiritually to feel safe physically, okay? That's one of the greatest things guys, that a woman can feel with you is safe, okay? Guys, you should make women feel safe by being men of character and gentlemen and all those things. Anyway, but fear destroys vulnerability and everything that follows it. If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you know what I'm talking about, where you feel like everything you say, every word that comes out of your mouth is going to be weaponized against you. That's not love. That's manipulation, how can we have an intimate relationship with God if we're afraid of what he's going to do or say? How can we be sincere or vulnerable or intimate when we think judgment awaits us? And so John's point is that because of the finished work of Christ, we don't have to live in fear that our relationship with God. And so God's love, right, it's perfected in Christ, casts out any fear we have because we know we are safe. And that security and safety allows us the freedom to live in Christ. And then when you have that security and that freedom in Christ, guess what? Then you get to Take those relationships, that relationship, into your other relationships with people. That's what he says in verse 19 when he says, we love, why? Because he first loved us. It's not just that we love God back, it's that we can love other people moving forward. This comes down to feeling safe and secure in Christ, knowing who we are in Christ. That's a matter of our identity. When you know who you are in Christ, right, then our capacity to love and be loved is magnified. And it's a direct result of living in God's love, letting him define us. So get this, your relational success comes from the overflow of a right relationship with God, okay? My ability to be a good husband or be a good dad or a good friend is completely coming out of the overflow of my relationship with God. If I have a trashy relationship with God, I am not going to be a good friend, let alone a good husband or a good dad, Okay? But our relationship success comes from an overflow of a right relationship with God, one where we're fully invested in him and allowing him to define the terms. So whether you're single, you're dating, or you're married, and you're in this room, remember, to be who God wants you to be in a relationship, you have to be who God wants you to be in a relationship with him first. Okay? It starts there. All right? So what I want to do, though, is we're going to talk about this fear a little bit and some of the fears that I've seen over the years and I want to name some of them, and I've seen some of them reveal themselves in the past even couple of weeks. I believe that our relationship with God is a solution to our fears, and because of that, I'm going to share some scripture, too, to help put some of these fears 
into perspective. So some of these are the fears that have been coming out. Here we go. I'm just going to go through these. First is the fear of loneliness, right? I don't want to be alone. Who wants to be alone the rest of our lives? And I think if we find ourselves single later in life, we start to wonder, has God blessed me with the gift of celibacy? Yay. Okay? Listen. I have taught a whole message on this gift of loneliness, all right? And, and I think it's somewhere on the internet. But look, we know Scripture teaches us this. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a, him a helper fit for him. Now, many of you are either looking for a helper or to be the helper. That's fantastic. And sometimes our fear leads us to compromise to fill that role rather than receive God's best. But remember, and I'll say this and I say it again, your singleness is a gift because it allows you to do what God wants you to do and to grow in your relationship with him and grow into the person he wants you to be outside of the pressures of being in a relationship with somebody else. Because guess what? When you're in a relationship with somebody else, now you're thinking about them too and how all that works together. So your singleness is a gift, and when it comes time or you've outgrown it, guess what? God will give you a new gift. And that gift could be another person, okay? Don't think that just because you have this gift now that it's the only gift you'll have the rest of your life because God likes giving gifts and more gifts, okay? Christmas comes every year, guys, right? So you ever, anyone ever get socks for Christmas and you outgrow your socks? Guess what? You get new socks. You get new gifts. My point is this. When you've maximized the gift of signals that God has for you, don't be surprised if he brings what you need. And if there's one thing God gives us, it's what we need when we need it. So if God knows it's not good for you to be alone, he's going to bring you that person when the time is right. The next fear, the fear of failure. Relationships are scary. What if it doesn't work out? What if I make a bad decision or it turns out I got catfished? What if we end up hating each other and we get divorced? Jesus says in Matthew 19, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one flesh. What, therefore, God has joined together, let not man separate. Now I want to focus on that phrase, that last part, what God has brought together, what God has joined together. If you build a godly foundation and God has put you with that person who is your fit and you continue to work on your marriage, then your marriage will stand the test of time. And look, Fear of failure is not a reason not to date or get married. What it is is that a desire to love and succeed should be the motivation to work hard and take no days off of your marriage. Okay? Because remember, this is ultimately God's work, what God has joined together. Of course, there's the fear of failure. There's also the fear of commitment. What if, uh, what if it does work out? What if we're married, but then somehow years down the road, I might, I might want something different. Or I change, or they change, right? Look, commitment, get this. Commitment is a choice that we make every day, and you choose to love the person you are with. Love is a choice that we have to make every day. And I guarantee, though, when you invest wholly in a person, you give them, you're, you put all your chips in, you're like, I'm all in, and they do the same for you, they will continue to be not just what you want, but what you need. It won't even be an issue. It says in Ecclesiastes, it says, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion or reward uh, in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. In other words, you know, enjoy the life with your wife. She's a reward for you. This life has got a lot of rough, bad things. But your spouse is a gift. Nurture that gift. Love that gift. Celebrate that gift. Commit to that gift. There's another one. It's a fear of losing ourselves. There's a fear of losing ourselves. Giving up too much of what we want, right? If I get in a relationship, I'm going to have to change everything about myself. Look, certainly you, listen, you don't date someone who wants you to change everything about you, okay? If you start dating somebody and they start listing off all the things about you that need to change, guess what? They don't want to date you. They want to date Someone else. They want to conform you to a version of something they want because guess what? You are not enough for them. You understand that? If you're dating someone, they start telling you everything that's wrong with you, you're like, yeah, you, you clearly want to date someone who's not me. Let me give you the opportunity. Bye. Okay? <laughs> but listen to this. Successful relationships are marked by our service to others and not to ourselves. Like Philippians says, do nothing out of 
selfish ambition or conceit. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here's my point. There is a big difference in giving yourself to someone and losing yourself to someone. Okay? The big difference. Okay? If a person is demanding you change to make them happy, then you're never going to make them happy. But if you are giving yourself to a person in service to them, to please them and love them, that's a different story altogether. That's Christ-like. There's also the fear of vulnerability. Getting hurt. Getting exposed. If I, if, I, if I reveal all of me, how will it be received? So a fear of vulnerability means, guess what? We hold things back. When if we're holding things back, that also means we're not being authentic with people. Think about vulnerabilities. It puts us at risk, doesn't it? When, when, when it, it puts us at risk and we give people access to our heart. And yeah, I get it. It leaves people, it leaves us open to attack. It leaves us open to being hurt. Okay. But vulnerability also offers great reward. Okay. It leaves us open to be embraced. And I think that's a tricky line. And that's where that safety thing comes into play again, where look, you should already start to feel when you start to go on a date with somebody that they're safe. Okay. You don't go on a date to find out if they're safe. You don't reveal yourself to find out how they're going to... You, you want to demonstrate that they're already safe. You want to demonstrate... They want to be people that demonstrate that they can handle your emotions. So when you reveal a little bit of it, if they laugh at you, don't reveal a lot, right? Okay. But I also think... Look, I think people don't make themselves vulnerable because they've been hurt before. And trusting again is hard. Trusting is hard. But I also think... Listen, I also think some people don't make themselves vulnerable because they are not authentic and vulnerability cracks their veneer all right and one of the reasons we're often not honest with other people is because we are not honest with ourselves when you are not true in your relationship with god and you're not comfortable in your own skin and you're not true to god and you're just putting up a front you're you're not really giving yourself to anybody you're not truly making yourself available to people but paul tells us he said Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look, I want to challenge you to think about this idea that God knows your vulnerability. The only person you're hiding from is yourself. Okay? So we, we, we make ourselves vulnerable because while there's a risk, there's also a reward. But we also have to make sure that we're not... Uh, afraid of the vulnerability that reveals our shortcomings um, because those expose us. And I want to challenge you, if you are living your life in a way where you're, where you're not revealing yourself because what's underneath is false or fake, that's something you need to work on with God. Of course, there's also the fear of trusting God. How do I know God has my best interest in mind, right? It's funny how many people don't seem to actually want God's help in relationships because either they think he won't give them what they want or they know he won't give them what they want because uh, they, they're asking for the wrong things. Anybody ever do that? Anybody ask God for something like, I want th- I'm not going to ask you, Lord, because I know the answer is no. Okay. Then why are you asking? I'm not asking. Then why do you want it? That's shh. <laughs> I made the comment, I made the comment uh, last week, and I think I said it was the fact that of all the relationships I was in, and I learned, I learned a lot about relationships from being in bad relationships, right? And so I took a lot of those lessons in. But the only relationship I remember actually praying about before it started was a relationship with Kristen. Okay? It wasn't, because a lot of times you get into a relationship, you're like, what do you think, Lord? It's pretty great, huh? He's like, nope. <laughs> Sorry I asked. You ruined it for me. Okay? But I prayed about it, and that's where the Lord led me, and it's, it has worked out. Look, Jesus reminds us this. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, uh, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? And if you then, who are evil, a little dig there from Jesus, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, Give good gifts to those who ask him. Okay? God gives 
good gifts. And so he is trustworthy. I challenge you to think about that. Do you want your version of it or do you want God's best? And finally, the last thing here, there's a fear of maturity and responsibility. I see that a lot. I don't want to grow up, right? Because delayed adolescence is awesome. Look, I think the fear of of maturity is directly related to the fear of responsibility because when I grow up, I'm going to have to do adult things and I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to be accountable. And sadly, yes, this mindset seems to affect men far more than women. But if TikTok has taught us anything, women are not immune. Thank you. (laughs) Timing is everything. Listen, and when we talk about adult things, what are adult things, right? Honesty, integrity, dignity, hard work, right? Paul makes a profound statement in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. Uh, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So when it comes to relationships, our mandates for maturity and responsibility are found in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3, which those verses are there in, in, your, in your notes. And they say they describe the roles that we play in marriage, roles we develop and begin to practice in the dating arena. But to fulfill those, we can't be afraid of the maturity and the responsibility that they demand. All right. So what? All right. Here's the so what. Resting in the safety of God's love means that we don't have to dwell on or in our fears. And when our relationship with God is right, the other important ones kind of start to fall into place. Ladies. Ladies. I'm going to say this. I haven't speak to the ladies. I'm going to speak to the guys. Ladies, here it is. You need to know who you are, confident in your God-given identity. Because a godly woman isn't defined as a tea-sipping, chocolate-eating, passive participant stereotype that dutifully obeys the whims of her handsome husband who brings home enough so he can raise the kids and make sure dinner's on by six, okay? And even the strong Christian woman stereotype doesn't encapsulate what a godly woman is. Because biblically, biblically, when you read the Bible, she's a warrior, a fighter, a businesswoman, uh, who displays wisdom, intelligence, and creativity, and she recognizes her ability to influence and shape the family. That woman, who is in Proverbs 31, is touted as the ideal. She's marked by confidence and strength and dignity and fearlessness. 1 Peter 3, 4 says that your adorning is the hidden person of the heart and with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And the question's, the question was asked the last two weeks about biblical roles, right? And, the, and, and we'll say this, like the woman who submits to her husband, she doesn't do it because she has to because she's so weak and she's so incapable. She does it because in it she honors God and she and obeys God. And it is in that position that a woman has the most influence and the most impact on the family and where she maximizes the availability and the use of her gifts. But hear this, a woman's submission, which I know becomes a big deal, to her husband is from a place of strength not of weakness. And it demands that a man step up and be worthy to lead, that he be a man worth following. Your roles, ladies, is built and based in strength, not weakness. And I want to challenge you that you need to take your identity cues from God's word and not man's ideas. And you need to make women like Abigail and Elizabeth and Naomi and J.L., and Salome, and Dorcas, and Priscilla, and more. These are your heroes. Godly women who were strong and were not above using tent stakes to get their way. Men. 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 You, uh uh-huh, listen, you have a high calling. And godly men living godly lives will shape and transform society. And yet... So many guys choose to surrender that calling to the siren song of immaturity and delayed adolescence. Too many guys are adult males, not men, because they refuse to take responsibility for themselves. They refuse to grow up past the middle school mentality, and they refuse to accept that their actions and behaviors set the tone for those around them. And I look, I see everywhere I go, I see so many children in adult bodies, and it breaks my heart, in God's heart, when we surrender our masculinity to immaturity and our leadership to laziness. 
But godly men rise above their circumstances and their challenges and demonstrate integrity and responsibility and compassion, maturity, and faithfulness. First to God and then to others. Real men don't care if they impress people or even if they're liked by everyone, okay? Uh, They do the right thing because it is the right thing. And these are men like Daniel and Paul and Joseph and David and Peter and, of course, Jesus. And when it comes to relationships, real men lead through service, setting others before themselves, even at a cost to themselves, and they make everyone around them better. So listen, gentlemen, it is not enough to be a physically adult male. Be a man. And if you don't know the difference, we'll talk about it later. Look, the reason godly dating is so hard is because people don't live up to their full identity and their responsibility in Christ. And then they wonder why God doesn't bless them. But for those who lean into the love of Christ, they fearlessly become who he wants them to be. You're going to find great contentment even in singleness. And the funny thing about that contentment is that comes with confidence and strength that's going to be attractive to the right person. And then it comes true what we may find that when we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else is added to you. All right. Father, thank you for the word of God. 